Hanks and Meg Ryan teamed up for their first movie in the cult classic Joe vs. the Volcano. Or maybe it's not really a cult classic. To be honest, I've never really had the desire to see that one. Anyway, that was in 1990. The duo wouldn't make their next romantic film for three years when they made the much more successful Sleepless in Seattle. That one I did see. Sandwiched between these two films, Tom Hanks teamed up with another of Hollywood's leading ladies in the early 1990s, Gina Davis, for A League of Their Own. The events in A League of Their Own tell the story of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, or the AAGPBL. If you're listening to this episode on the day it's released, then tomorrow, May 30th, 2017, marks the 74th anniversary of opening day for the very first season of the AAGPBL. That would make it May 30th, 1943, about two years after the United States entered World War II. So as we're waiting to see if the Chicago Cubs can repeat after breaking their streak of over a hundred years without a title, or maybe it'll be the Cleveland Indians who finally get a pennant this year. In either case, as we're enjoying the professional baseball season this time of year, I thought it'd be a great opportunity to honor the women who laced up their cleats and took the field to play professional baseball during and after World War II. I'm Dan Lefebvre, and this is Based on a True Story. It's time for Two Truths and a Lie. Listen closely for the two truths scattered throughout the episode. Then, by process of elimination, you'll know which one was a lie. We'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. Okay, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, all of the characters' names in the movie are fictional. Number two, the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League only played as a temporary replacement for the Major League Baseball players during World War II. Number three, the girls' league started with underhand pitching, more like softball than overhand baseball. Before we get back to the show, did you know that you can sponsor your own episode of Based on a True Story? Learn more over at patreon.com slash based on a true story podcast. Now, I'm always open to requests for episodes, and that's completely free, but because my backlog of episodes is currently hovering around 200 movies, I can't guarantee that I'll get to the movie you wanted to see covered anytime soon. So if you want to make sure that your request gets bumped to the front of the line, hop over to patreon.com slash based on a true story podcast to pick the movie of your own sponsored episode. As an added benefit, your sponsorship will help make sure that I can keep buying the movies, books, research materials, hosting, and all of the other costs that go into making this show. Once again, that's patreon.com slash based on a true story podcast. And with that, let's compare history with Hollywood's version of A League of Their Own. The movie begins, as many films do, with a moment before a flashback. This one is by a woman named Dottie Hinson, who's played by Lynn Cartwright, as she arrives at a baseball field to see a bunch of women wearing white AAGPBL shirts. As she watches, the movie shifts to a flashback by way of news footage. In this footage, the basis for the movie is set up. World War II is in full swing, and many of the professional baseball players have been called on to help with the war effort. As a result, there's no professional baseball being played and, according to the movie, it's a candy man by the name of Walter Harvey who's trying to find a way to keep baseball going. That is sort of true, but it's also not sort of true. Let me explain. We all know that World War II was indeed in full swing in 1943. And it is true that many of the professional baseball players were called into military service, for example, Red Sox legend Ted Williams served as a pilot in the Navy, earning a lot of admiration from fellow pilots. It's also worth pointing out that not all pro ball players put their lives at risk quite like Ted Williams did. Many pro ball players opted to join the military baseball teams, instead offering entertainment for the servicemen instead of going into battle themselves. 
Still, although he was willing to go into battle and successfully passed all of the training to become a pilot, the war ended before Ted Williams saw action. He did, though, stay in the reserves for the Marines and served as a pilot in the Korean War. But that's getting ahead of our story. Oh, and in the movie, the news footage mentions Yankee slugger Joe DiMaggio joining the military. That's true. Joe enlisted in February of 1943, although he mostly played baseball in the service. Why baseball in the military instead of helping directly with the war effort? Well, the best answer to that probably comes from President Franklin Delano Roosevelt himself. He wrote this letter to Kennesaw Mountain Landis. Kennesaw Mountain is not a place. Well, it is. It's a mountain in Georgia, but it's also the name of the very first commissioner of Major League Baseball. The commissioner was named after the mountain. Anyway, President Roosevelt wrote this letter to Commissioner Landis on January 14, 1942. My dear judge, thank you for yours of January 14th. As you will, of course, realize the final decision about the baseball season must rest with you and the baseball club owners. So what I am going to say is solely a personal and not an official point of view. I honestly feel that it would be best for the country to keep baseball going. There will be fewer people unemployed, and everybody will work longer hours and harder than ever before. And that means they ought to have a chance for recreation and for taking their minds off their work even more than before. Baseball provides a recreation which does not last over two hours or two hours and a half, and which can be got for very little cost. And, incidentally, I hope that night games can be extended because it gives an opportunity to the day shift to see a game occasionally. As to the players themselves, I know you agree with me that the individual players who are active military or naval age should go, without question, into the services, even if the actual quality to the teams is lowered by the greater use of older players, this will not dampen the popularity of the sport. Of course. If an individual has some particular aptitude in a trade or profession, he ought to serve the government. That, however, is a matter which I know you can handle with complete justice. Here is another way of looking at it. If 300 teams use 5,000 or 6,000 players, these players are a definite recreational asset to at least 20 million of the fellow citizens, and that, in my judgment, is thoroughly worthwhile. With every best wish, very sincerely yours, Franklin D. Roosevelt. So, as we can see, baseball was considered an important method of getting people's minds off of the war. A war that was everywhere else in life except, they hoped, on the ball field. So that's why baseball, both inside the military and outside of service, was considered so important. Ultimately, Landis decided to keep Major League Baseball going. So while many pro players did indeed go off to serve in the war, professional baseball did not stop in the United States. And that brings us to where the footage is sort of not true. Although the footage in the film never comes out and says baseball stops, it does say that there's speculation that baseball will stop for the duration of the war. Then it goes on to imply very strongly that this is the reason for candy bar king Walter Harvey deciding to come up with a professional women's baseball league. That's not really true. Oh, and Walter Harvey never owned the Chicago Cubs like the movie implies because Walter Harvey never existed. But it was the Cubs' real owner, Chewing Gum King Philip K. Wrigley, who came up with the idea for the Professional Women's League. However, it wasn't really to replace men's baseball. In fact, Wrigley had the idea that when the men's teams were playing away games, that's when women could play games at their big league stadiums. In Wrigley's mind, that would help the fact that the stadiums were lying dormant for half the time when the team was away. You see, with an increased number of men and women being called on to help with the war effort in big industrial cities, that would mean any time the teams were out of town, they would be without well-deserved entertainment as a break from their work. And that's what Wrigley was trying to solve by creating more baseball teams. And I'm sure making a fancy profit off of their desire for a mental break from the war wasn't far from Wrigley's mind either. 
Regardless, the point here is that while the movie implies the women's league was started as a replacement to men's professional baseball, they were actually both playing at the same time. In fact, if you look at some of the old box scores in newspapers, you'll find men's baseball box scores right alongside the reports of women's games. Back in the movie, after the stage is set for the story, we see text on screen that says it's Willamette Valley, Oregon in the year 1943. It's here that we're introduced to the two women who are the stars of the film, Dottie Hinson and her sister, Kit Keller. Dottie is played by Gina Davis, while Kit is portrayed by Lori Petty. Willamette Valley is a real place in Oregon. If you remember, that's the destination from the classic 1970s computer game called Oregon Trail, as well as the recent reincarnation board game of the same name. Despite this bit of reality, the sisterly characters of Dottie and Kit are not real people. They're composite characters made up for the film. For Gina Davis's character of Dottie Hinson, most historians agree the real person she's based on most was probably a woman named Dorothy Kamenchek. As was common for the 1940s, anyone named Dorothy often went by the nickname Dottie, and Dorothy Kamenchek was no different. Perhaps one of the reasons why so many think that she was the basis for the character of Dottie Hinson was because the real Dottie Kamenchek was considered by many to have been the best player in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, the AAG PBL. The real Dottie had a career batting average around 300, something that most historians equate to hitting about 400 in Major League Baseball. If you're a fan of baseball, you'll know how rare of a feat that is. Like Gina Davis's character, Dottie Kamenchek started her career in the AAG PBL on the Rockford Peaches team out of Rockford, Illinois. That was like the movie indicates in 1943 when the league began. Although she wasn't a catcher like Gina Davis's character was, the real Dottie started in the outfield but soon moved over to first base. To give you an idea of how good the real Dottie was, she struck out 81 times. That might not sound too great considering in the movie Dottie Henson was only in the league for one year, but the real Dottie Kamenchek played in the league for 10 years and took part in every one of seven All-Star games that the league played. As you can probably guess, seven All-Star games in 10 years means the league didn't have one every year that Dottie played. But back to that strikeout total. Striking out 81 times over 10 years, it's much more impressive now, and you get a sense for how good she was. Oh, and those 81 strikeouts came in a total of 3,736 at-bats. If you're not a sports fan, just for some context here, the toughest batter in the history of Major League Baseball, the men's league that still exists today, to strike out was Joe Sewell. He played in the 1920s with the Cleveland Indians and New York Yankees, and over the span of 14 years, he had 7,132 at-bats and struck out only 114 times. On the other side of that record, the batter with the most strikeouts in Major League Baseball was Mark Reynolds in 2009 with 223 strikeouts in just 578 at-bats. Joel Sewell's average of around 63 at-bats per strikeout was just barely better than Dottie's average of 46 at-bats per strikeout, and both Joe and Dottie were infinitely more difficult to strike out than many of the players that are playing in the Major League Baseball today. While Gina Davis's character in the movie might have gotten some of the on-field talents from Dottie Kamenchek, there were some other women who inspired other aspects of the woman that we see on the big screen. Other women who inspired parts of the character of Dottie Hinson were Mary Bonnie Baker, who many believe to have had a similar personality to what we saw Gina Davis's character have in the film. Or there was LaVon Pepper Pear Davis, who was another star in the AAG PBL and also a catcher like Dottie Hinson. Although Pepper also played some shortstop, which we didn't see Gina Davis's character do. There's also another Dorothy in the picture, Dorothy Dottie Green, often gets credited with being the major inspiration for Dottie Hinson, but that's not really the case. It can get so confusing with so many people named Dottie, but Dottie Green was Dottie Kamenchek's teammate, and while she shared some things in common with Dottie Hinson, she wasn't the best player in the league like her teammate, Dottie Kamenchek. She's still worth mentioning, though, because she was the catcher on the Rockford Peaches like Dottie Henson. Although she also played for more than one year, Dottie Green played until 1947 when a knee injury forced her to stop playing. 
but she stayed involved with the team as sort of a team chaperone up until the AEG PBL was disbanded. Since Gina Davis's character of Dottie Hinson was the catcher on the Rockford Peaches and sort of like a team captain like Dottie Green was after her injury, maybe that's why some people see the comparisons. Regardless, though, the overall difference here between history and Hollywood's portrayal is that Dottie Hinson wasn't a real person. She was a fictitious character made up from a range of inspirational women in the AAG PBL. So if the filmmakers made up the main character in A League of Their Own, what does that say for the rest of the characters? It's probably not much of a surprise then to learn that the same is true for pretty much all of the characters that we see in the movie. While there were many sister combos in the real AAG PBL, Dottie Kamenchik wasn't one of the women who had a sister playing in the league. So Dottie Hinson's sister in the movie, Kit, isn't based on any one real person named Kit Keller. There was no Kit Keller in the league. But she's the filmmaker's way of showing us what it must have been like for some of the sister combos in the league. Of course, in a very fictional way. As you can probably guess, if the characters themselves aren't real, most of the storyline of the film also isn't real. In fact, one of the other women who some think inspired Gina Davis's character in part was a woman named Doris Sams. Sadly, Doris has since passed, but she did get the chance to watch A League of Their Own. Her succinct interpretation was that the movie was about 30% truth, leaving the remaining 70% as being made up by the filmmakers. Back in the movie, another one of the fictional people made up for the film is the guy who founded the AAG PBL, Walter Harvey. In the movie, Walter is referred to as the Chocolate King or a candy bar mogul. As I mentioned briefly earlier, the real person who the fictional Walter Harvey is based on was none other than Philip K. Wrigley. If that last name sounds familiar, it's because you've probably had Wrigley chewing gum. Or maybe you've been to Wrigley Field, the home of the baseball team Philip Wrigley owned the recent world champion Chicago Cubs. Of course, in the movie, we see it as Harvey Field, but it does have the ivy on the outfield walls, just like the real Wrigley Field does. Real Wrigley Field. Say that 10 times fast. Anyway, what the movie doesn't mention, though, is that there's another man who was behind the forming of the AAG PBL. That other man was another name that might sound familiar if you're a fan of Major League Baseball. Branch Rickey. Branch Rickey was the general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, and he was the man who pushed to have Jackie Robinson break the color barrier in the major leagues. You can learn more about that story in an earlier episode of the Based on a True Story podcast when we compared history with the movie 42. Harrison Ford was the actor who played Branch Rickey in the movie simply named 42 after Jackie Robinson's number. But still, it's quite interesting that Branch Rickey was involved in both Jackie Robinson's entry into the majors, as well as the formation of the AAG PBL. Another character we see in the film is Ira Lowenstein, who's played by David Strathairn. According to the movie, Ira is vital to taking Walter Harvey's idea and implementing the logistics of it. In history, the real person who'd probably be the closest fit to Ira Lowenstein was a man named Ken Sells. That's S-E-L-L-S. Ken worked for Philip Wrigley at the time as an assistant general manager for the Chicago Cubs. So Wrigley tasked Ken with helping build the league, and he was named the president of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Oh, and while we're on the topic of the name of the league, there's something else that's worth pointing out. In the movie, we see most of the women throwing overhand like you'd see baseball players do. After all, it's a baseball league and they're playing baseball, not softball, right? Well, that's sort of true. The women in the AAG PBL played baseball rules, but most of the women came from softball leagues. So the movie is inaccurate when it depicts the women throwing overhand in 1943 when the league was formed. In truth, the league was actually originally called the All-American Girls Softball League, but in the first season in 1943, it was renamed to All-American Girls Baseball League. Despite this name change, most of the women came from softball, but Wrigley and the league founders wanted it to be a little bit more like baseball, so the result was more of a hybrid of softball and baseball. For example, the girls didn't use a baseball like we see in the movie. In truth, they used a softball with a 12-inch circumference, or about 30 and a half centimeters. And the pitchers didn't throw overhand like we saw in the movie. They threw underhand like they did when they played softball. 
The pitcher's mound also wasn't 60 feet and 6 inches like it is in Major League Baseball at the time, and still today, but rather about 40 feet away from the plate. Oh, and that 60.5 feet is about 18.4 meters compared to the AAG PBL of 40 feet being about 12 meters. Also, the distance between bases wasn't quite what we see in Major League Baseball. It's 90 feet in Major League Baseball or about 27 meters between bases. But in the AAG PBL, it was 65 feet or almost 20 meters. While the distances may have been more in line with softball, it wasn't straight up softball. For example, in softball, you can't steal bases, but in the AAG PBL, you could. The movie doesn't mention this, of course, as the story doesn't make it much past the first season. But as the AAG PBL played, the rules drifted more and more away from softball toward baseball. For example, after five years of play in 1948, the league switched from being all underhand to allowing overhand pitches from a distance of 50 feet or a little over 15 meters. A few years later, in 1954, the ball itself changed from a 12-inch softball to a 9-inch baseball, as well as stretching out the base paths to 85 feet apart, or almost 26 meters. Of course, 1954 would end up being the final year of the AAG PBL, but hopefully you can start to get a sense for how the league started very similar to softball and started to shift more and more toward baseball. There's a brief moment in the movie when John Lovitz's character, Ernie Cappadino, is recruiting Gina Davis's character, and he mentions the salaries for the girls playing ball is $75 a week. Although Ernie is also a fictitious character, the filmmakers actually created that character specifically with John Lovitz in mind. The salary is pretty close. Women in the AAG PBL would earn a range from $45 to $85 a week. That's about the same as $650 to about $1,200 per week today. That's not too bad of a salary. By comparison, according to a paper by William Whitaker at the Congressional Research Service, the average manufacturing job in 1943 paid about 88 cents per hour. Couple that with other documentation that estimates manufacturing jobs worked an average of 44.2 hours per week in 1943, that would come out to just less than $40 per week. As a little side note, obviously other jobs pay higher than manufacturing, and some pay less. However, a lot of the women's teams were set up in cities that had a higher number of industrial workers due to the war effort. That's why I'm comparing their salaries to the average pay of the workers who'd probably be paying to see them play. Of course, we'd also have to take into account the hours. The women in the AAG PBL had to work much longer than 44 hours a week. A little more on that later. And with travel, the league certainly was more a way of life than a job that you get to go home at the end of the day. But still... All things considered, the women were getting to play ball and getting paid for it. Not too bad. Speaking of the league being a way of life, back in the movie, this is perhaps most obvious after the moment where the women are broken up into teams. It's then that David Straythorne's version of Ira Lowenstein mentions the uniforms. A motto gets up on the dugout to strut the short skirts the women will have to wear. That's true. While the women may have gotten a relatively decent salary considering it was the 1940s, it was still the 1940s and the men in charge of the league decided they should be objectified. So it is true that they had to wear short skirts, much like what we saw in the movie. And this also meant tearing up their legs was common because despite what we saw Madonna's character do in the movie, the real women in the league never slid head first. Instead, they slid feet first, meaning they'd be sliding on their bare legs. According to Doris Sams, the ball player that we learned about earlier, you haven't lived until you've slid on skin. So it'd seem that that scene in the movie where we see one of the girls getting a massive strawberry, a bruise, on her leg after sliding is pretty spot on. But being objectified on the field wasn't enough. Again, 1940s. While the specific scenes were all but made up for the movie, the general plot line of the women having to go to charm classes was pretty accurate as well. Remember when we were chatting about the women having to work longer than 44 hours a week? As if playing 120 games in the span of four months wasn't enough, after an exhausting day on the field, the women were expected to attend Helena Rubinstein's charm school in the evenings. Well, That is, those evenings that they weren't needed on the field for another of their many day-night doubleheaders. At this charm school, women would be taught, quote, 
proper, unquote, etiquette, manners, personal hygiene, and dress code for many situations that they might encounter, just to name a few things. Oh, and the women were required to carry around a beauty kit that they were given and taught how to use. They also weren't allowed to have short hair, couldn't smoke or drink in public, and they had to wear lipstick at all times. Anyone caught breaking one of these league rules would be fined $5. That's about $70 today. The second fine would go up to $10, or the equivalent of $150 today. A third time would end up with you just being suspended from the league. Perhaps it's time to take back my not-too-bad comment from earlier. Sure, that was about the pay, but even a semi-decent salary for playing baseball doesn't make up for the stereotypical objectification that the women had to endure. In the movie, one of the characters we haven't talked about yet was someone who didn't really have to be subjected to the objectification that the women on the field did. That's because he was in the dugout, and, well, he was a he. I'm speaking, of course, of Tom Hanks' character, Jimmy Dugan. In the movie, Jimmy is portrayed as a former star turned drunk who ends up managing the Rockford Peaches after the league's founder, Walter Harvey, asked him to be a face for the league. While Jimmy Dugan is a made-up person, just like there were some real people who went into Gina Davis's character, there were some very real baseball players that went into the character that we saw Tom Hanks playing on screen. The primary source of inspiration for the character of Jimmy Dugan was another Jimmy, except this one is spelled I-E instead of with a Y. That's Jimmy Fox. Jimmy with an I-E and Fox with two X's. However, Jimmy Fox played baseball from 1924 to 1945, so there's no way he could have been managing the first year for the AAG PBL in 1943. While we don't really learn much about Tom Hanks' character's stats, the implication in the film is that he was a great player. And the real Jimmy Fox was indeed a great player, one of the best of all time. During his 20-year career, Jimmy was an all-star for nine of those. He was also a four-time American League home run champion, three-time American League MVP, three-time American League RBI leader, three-time batting champion, and two-time World Series champion. One of those years, he did something that very few people have ever done in the history of Major League Baseball, hit for a triple crown. A triple crown is where you lead the league in batting average, home runs, and runs batted in in the same year. Jimmy did that in 1933 when he had a batting average of 365, he had 48 home runs, and 163 RBIs or runs batted in. While history hasn't remembered Jimmy as well, during his career, he was on par with some of the other players who shared the field with him during the All-Star Games, such as Hank Greenberg, Lou Gehrig, and Joe DiMaggio. Perhaps one of the reasons why history hasn't remembered Jimmy Fox as well as it has Lou Gehrig or Joe DiMaggio is because toward the end of Jimmy's career, he started to decline due to what many historians believe was an increasingly pronounced drinking problem. A little more relevant to our story today, Jimmy Fox did spend one year managing one of the teams from the AAG PBL, although that happened in 1952, not in 1943 like we see in the movie. And Jimmy Fox didn't manage the Rockford Peaches like Tom Hanks' character of Jimmy Dugan did in the film. Instead, Jimmy Fox managed the Fort Wayne Daisies, although Jimmy's experience seemed to help as he managed the team to the playoffs where they lost to the Rockford Peaches two games to one. Another former professional baseball player that went into the character of Jimmy Dugan was Hack Wilson. Well, his real name was Lewis, but Hack was his nickname. Hack played from 1923 to 1934, so he was out of professional baseball before the AAG PBL began in 1943. Like Jimmy Dugan, the real Hack Wilson had a great career. Wasn't as good as Jimmy Fox's career, but to this day, Hack Wilson still holds the record for most RBIs in a single season at 191. That was in 1930. Up until Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire snapped it in 1998, Hack also held the record for most home runs in the National League with 56. That was also in 1930, meaning it was a record that he held for almost 70 years. That year, 1930, Hack Wilson had what most baseball historians refer to as one of the best single seasons ever. 
Like both Jimmy Fox and the fictional Jimmy Dugan, Hack Wilson's career spiraled down into a drinking habit. His 1930 year was amazing, but it seemed to have gone to his head. In 1931, Hack Wilson reported to the team about 20 pounds or about 9 kilograms overweight. It was the beginning of the end for his career that would ultimately only last a few more years. Unlike Jimmy Fox, Hack Wilson never managed an All-American Girls Professional Baseball League team. Although, quite honestly, we can't really say that the character of Jimmy Dugan was meant to be Jimmy Fox or Hack Wilson. Tom Hanks' character did have plenty of inspiration from these two great baseball players who had amazing success in their careers, only to see it all slip away through the bottle. But there was also a very healthy dose of Hollywood's creative freedom thrown in there as well. Back in the movie were again hit with sexism at play in the 1940s when not only does Tom Hanks' character as the team manager think that women aren't real ballplayers, but it's evident that many of the men in the stands don't think they are either. While we know Jimmy Dugan wasn't real, sadly, the sexism was. One newspaper article from the day after the league's opening on May 31st, 1943, called the league a powder puff brand of baseball and referred to the women as fresh from the beauty parlor and that the game is more than meets the eye, although what meets the eye is nice too. Or there was another article that referred to the league as nothing more than a glamour softball league. If you remember when the league started, it resembled softball quite a bit more than what we saw in the movie. Although, as we learned, the women were required to carry around that beauty kit as if it was part of their uniform, their scantily clad uniform. So maybe the article isn't too far off and it's just that everything was sexist back then. But then again, as the saying goes, two wrongs don't make a right. But we can get the sense that it would seem there's something to the claim we saw in the movie that the scouts were looking for pretty women to join the league. Talented, sure, but the league didn't seem to hide that they were objectifying the women, so talent alone wasn't enough. Toward the end of the movie, the two main characters, the sisters Dottie and Kit, meet each other in the championship. As it turns out, it's Kit who gets the better of her older sister and her team the Racine Bells, wins the championship. We already learned Dottie and Kit weren't real people, so obviously none of the specific scenes that we saw in the film were real. But the movie is correct in showing that it was the Racine Bells who won the very first championship for the AAG PBL after the inaugural 1943 season. But they didn't play the Rockford Peaches. Actually, the real Rockford Peaches had the very worst record in the league both the first half and the second half of the season. So as you can probably guess, they didn't make it to the championship. Instead, the Racine Bells beat the Kenosha Comets in three straight games to win the best of five championship series. For their efforts, each of the women on the Racine Bells got a $228 bonus. That's about $3,200 today. Each of the women in the Kenosha Comets got a bonus of $146 for making the championship series. That's about $2,000 today. At the very end of the movie, older versions of Dottie Henson and Kit Keller meet up at the same reunion we saw in the beginning of the movie. Except this time, instead of being at a baseball field, they're inside Major League Baseball's Hall of Fame. We see Ira Lowenstein cutting the ribbon to a new room in the Hall of Fame dedicated to the women who played in the AAG PBL. While obviously the scenario with the fictional characters is, well, fictional, we can assume this must have happened around 1988 because that's when the permanent Women in Baseball exhibit we saw at the end of the movie opened in the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York to honor the women in the AAG PBL. As a quick side note, it's worth pointing out that the acronym changed multiple times throughout the league's lifetime. If you remember... When it first started, it was the All-American Girls Softball League, but it was quickly changed to the All-American Girls Baseball League, or the AAGBBL. Then, people didn't like baseball being in the name because they had underhand pitching, more like softball. So it was changed to the AAGPBL, or the All-American Girls Professional Ball League. Then it would be renamed again back to the AAGBBL, or the All-American Girls Baseball League, Then it was shortened to the All-American Girls Baseball League, or the AGBL, which it kept until the league's end in 1954. However, 
the recognition by the National Baseball Hall of Fame was done with the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League Players Association. So that's why they use the acronym AAGPBL, and that's the one that has become well known for the league today. In fact, that Women in Baseball exhibit in the National Baseball Hall of Fame not only helped bring those talented women back to the forefront of the public's eye, but in a very Hollywood-esque way of going full circle, it was that exhibit that inspired the creation of the movie A League of Their Own, which would release just four years after the exhibit. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. To learn more about the talented women who played in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, I would really recommend checking out the official website for the AAGPBL over at aagpbl.org. On their site, you can read more stories of the real women, look up stats, records, and plenty more. Before we get to the two truths and a lie game, let's share another review. This one actually isn't a five-star review. It's a three-star review, and it comes from Jana Lynn, who says, quote, Every now and then, you come across Hidden Genius and wonder, why haven't I heard of him or her before? That happened with your show. Now that I've found it, I hope we will have a long-lasting relationship. Thanks for the entertainment. You're a genius. Your new biggest fan, Jana Lynn. Wow, so awesome. Thank you so much, Jana Lynn. Although I must admit, I'm a little conflicted. That certainly sounds like a five-star review, but it's only three stars. <laughs> That's okay. Everyone's different, and I know this show isn't going to be for everyone. But thank you so much for taking the time to write such kind words and for leaving that compliment. I'm so happy that you've been able to find the show and that you found it entertaining. Thank you, Jana Lynn. And thank you, dear listener, for taking the time to find and listen to the Based on a True Story podcast. If you want to leave a review for me to read in a future episode, hop over to iTunes. Of course, I'd prefer a five-star review, but if you feel the show isn't worth five stars, I'd love to hear that as well. If you've listened to the show from the beginning, hopefully you've heard improvements with each episode, so I'm always looking for ways to improve. Now, if you're not an Apple person, you don't have to use iTunes to leave a review. You can also leave a review for the show on the Based on a True Story podcast Facebook page over at facebook.com slash based on a true story podcast. Finally, it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, all of the characters' names in the movie are fictional. Number two, the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League only played as a temporary replacement for the Major League Baseball players during World War II. Number three, the girls' league started with underhand pitching, more like softball than overhand baseball. Did you find out which one is a lie? The lie is number two. While there were men who went from professional baseball players to serving during World War II, the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League was not a replacement for men's baseball during the war. We know this from a few of the facts that we learned about in the show. For example, men's baseball kept going during the war, even though some of the stars left for the armed forces. Also, if it was a replacement, the girls' league would have ended when the war was over, but it didn't. The league continued until 1954, about nine years after World War II ended. Thanks again for listening. Next time you're on Facebook, do me a favor and search for the Based on a True Story podcast Facebook group. Once you find it, hit join group. I'll approve your membership, and then I'd encourage you to start a new post with what you thought of the story from A League of Their Own. Did anything about the real history behind the story on screen surprise you? You can also find the show on Instagram at Based on a True Story Podcast, where I like to share some of the faces and places of the real events and people behind the movie. Or you can find me directly on Twitter, where I'm at Dan Lefebvre, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B. Or maybe you're not a fan of social media. You can shoot me a good old-fashioned email at dan at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon. <laughs>